The Little Book of Eternal Wisdom, Part 1 Here begins the preface to this book. A preacher once stood, after matins, before a crucifix, and complained from his heart to God that he could not meditate properly on his torments and passion, and that this was very bitter for him, inasmuch as, up to that hour, he had in consequence suffered so much. And, as he thus stood with his complaint, his interior senses were wrapped to an unusual exaltation, in which he was very speedily and clearly enlightened as follows. Thou shalt make a hundred venias. A venia is a p position performed by the Dominican order in which you lay on the ground on your right side. And each venia, with a special meditation of my passion, and each meditation with a request, and every one of my sufferings shall be spiritually impressed upon thee, to suffer the same again through me as far as thou art able. And as he thus stood in the light, and would need count the venias, he found only ninety, upon which he spoke to God thus, Sweet Lord, thou, thou didst speak of a hundred venias, I find only ninety. Then he was reminded of ten others which he had already made in the chapter house, before solemnizing, according to his custom, the devout meditation of the miserable leading forth of Christ to death, and coming before that very crucifix. And so he found that the hundred meditations had entirely included from beginning to end his bitter passion and death. And when he began to exercise himself in this matter, as he had been directed, his former dryness was changed into an interior sweetness. Now it was his request that if, perchance, any one else had the same imperfection, and felt the same dryness and bitterness in meditating on Christ's passion, in which all sanctification lies, he too might be assisted, and might exercise himself therein, and not desist until he had attained salvation. And, therefore, he wrote his meditations down, and wrote them in German, because he had so received them from God. Accordingly, he gained many a bright inspiration of divine truth, whereas these meditations were a cause, and between him and the eternal wisdom there sprang up a tender intercourse, and this took place not by a bodily intercourse, nor by figurative answers. It took place slow, solely by meditation in the light of holy writ, whose answers can deceive in nothing, so that the answers are taken either from the mouth of the eternal wisdom, who uttered them herself in the gospel, or else from the highest doctors, and they comprise either the same words or the same sense, or else such truths as are agreeable to holy writ, out of whose mouth the eternal wisdom spoke. Nor did the visions which hereafter follow take place in a bodily way. They are but an interpreted simil similitude. The answer touching our blessed lady's complaint he has given in the sense of St. Bernard's words, and the reason why he propounds his doctrine by question and answer is that it may prove the more attractive, that it may not seem as though he were the person to whom the doctrine belonged, or who had spoken it as coming from himself. His object is to give a general doctrine in which he and all persons may find every one what is suitable for himself. He takes upon himself, as a teacher ought to do, the person of all mankind. 
Now he speaks in the person of a sinner, now under the image of a love-sick soul. Then, as the matter suggests, even in the likeness of a servant with whom the eternal wisdom discourses. Moreover, everything is expounded with reference to our interior. Much is given here as doctrine that a zealous man should choose out for himself as devout prayer. The thoughts which stand here are simple, the words simpler still, for they proceed from a simple soul and are meant for simple men who have still their imperfections to cast aside. It happens that, as the same brother had begun to write on the three matters, namely the passion and the rest of it all, and had come to that part on repentance, Now then, cheer up, thou soul of mine, he had reclined himself one forenoon in his chair, and in that in a bright sleep he saw clearly, in a vision, how two culpable persons sat before him, and how he chastised them very severely for sitting there so idly, and performing nothing. Then it was given him to understand that he should thread a needle, which was put into his hand. Now the thread was threefold and two parts were very fine, but the other part was a little coarser. And when he would needs twist the three together, he could not well do it. Then he saw close to him on his right hand our Lord, standing the same as when he was unbound from the pillar, and he stood before him with a look so kind and fatherly that he thought it was indeed his father. Now he perceived that his body had quite a natural color. It was not very white, but the color of wheat, that is, white and red well mixed together. And this is the most natural color of all. And he perceived that his whole body was covered with wounds, and that they were quite fresh and bloody, that some were round, some angular, some very long, just as the whips had torn him. And as he thus stood sweetly before him, and kindly looked at him, the preacher raised his hands and rubbed them to and fro on his bloody wounds, then took three parts of the thread and twisted them easily together. Then was given to him a power, that he understood that he was to complete his task, and that God with his rose-colored garment which is wrought so delightfully out of his wounds, would clothe all those in eternal beauty who should occupy their time and leisure with it here below. One thing, however, a man should know, that there is as great a difference between hearing himself the sweet accords of a harp and hearing another speak of them as there is between the words received in pure grace and that flow out of a living heart, through a living mouth, and in those same words when they come to be set down on dead parchment, especially in the German tongue. For then are they chilled, and they wither like plucked roses. For the sprightliness of their delivery, which, for the sprightliness of their delivery, which, more than anything, moves the heart of man, is then extinguished, and in the dryness of dry hearts are they received. Never was there a string, how sweet soever, but it became dumb when stretched on a dry log. A joyless heart can as little understand a joyful tongue as a German and Englishman. Therefore let every fervent soul hasten after the first outpourings of this sweet doctrine, so that she may learn to contemplate them in their origin, where they were in all their loveliness and ravishing beauty. Even there are the inpourings of the present grace to the quickening of hearts that are dead. And he who thus looks at this book 
will hardly have read it through before his heart will, will needs be deeply moved either in fervent love, or to new light, or to a yearning towards God and abhorrence of sin, or else to some spiritual request wherein the soul will presently be renewed in grace. Here ends the preface. Part the First Chapter 1 How Some Persons Are Unconsciously Attracted by God Her have I loved, and have sought her out from my youth, and have desired to take her for my spouse, and I became a lover of her beauty. These words stand written in the Book of Wisdom, and are spoken by the beautiful and all-loving Wisdom. A servant was filled with disgust and dejection of heart on his first setting forth on the uneven ways. Then did the eternal Wisdom meet him in a spiritual and ineffable form, and lead him through bitter and sweet until she brought him to the right path of divine truth. And after well reflecting on his wonderful progress, he thus spoke to God, Sweet and tender Lord, from the days of my childhood my mind has sought for something with burning thirst, but what it is I have not yet fully understood. Lord, I have pursued it ardently many a year, but I never could grasp it, for I know not what it is, and yet it is something that attracts my heart and soul, without which I can never attain true rest. Lord, I sought it in the first days of my childhood, as I saw done around me in creatures, but the more I sought it in them, the less I found it, and the nearer I approached them, the further I receded from it, for every image that presented itself to my sight, before I wholly tried it, or gave myself up quietly to it, warned me away thus, I am not what thou seekest, and this repulsion I have experienced more and more in all things. Lord, now my heart rages after it, for my heart would so gladly possess it. Alas, I have so constantly had to experience what it is not. But what it is, Lord, I am not yet clear. Tell me, beloved Lord, what, I what it is indeed, and what is its nature, that so secretly agitates me? Answer of Eternal Wisdom Dost thou not know it? and yet it has lovingly embraced thee, has often stopped thee in the way, and until it has at length won thee for itself alone. The Servant Lord, I never saw it, never heard of it, I know not what it is. Eternal Wisdom This is not surprising, for its strangeness and thy familiarity with creatures were the cause. But now open thy interior eyes, and see who I am. It is I, the Eternal Wisdom, who, with the embrace of my Eternal Providence, have chosen thee in eternity for myself alone. I have barred the way to thee as often as thou wouldst have parted company with me, had I permitted thee. In all things thou didst ever meet with some obstacle, and it, it is the sweet sign of my elect that I needs have them for myself. The Servant Tender loving wisdom, and is it thou I have so long been seeking for? Is it thou my spirit has so constantly struggled for? Alas, my God! Why didst thou not show thyself to me long ago? Why hast thou delayed so long? How many a weary way have I not wandered? Eternal Wisdom Had I done so, thou wouldst not have known my goodness so sensibly as now thou knowest it. 
the servant. O oh, unfathomable goodness, how very sweetly thou hast not manifested thyself to me. And when I was not, thou gavest me being. When I had separated from thee, thou didst not separate from me. When I wished to escape from thee, thou didst hold me sweetly captive. Yes, thou eternal wisdom, if my heart might embrace thee and consume all my days with thee in love and praise, such would be its desire. For truly that man is blessed whom thou dost anticipate so lovingly that thou lettest him have nowhere true rest, till he seeks his rest in thee alone. O oh, wisdom elect, since in thee I have found him whom my soul loveth, despise not thy poor creature. See how dumb my heart is to all the world in joy and sorrow. Lord, is my heart always to be dumb towards thee? O oh, give my wretched soul leave, my dearest Lord, to speak a word with thee, for my heart is too full to contain itself any longer. Neither has it any one in this world to whom it can unburden itself, except to thee, my elected Lord, Father and Brother. Lord, thou, thou alone knowest the nature of a love-overflowing heart, and knowest that no one can love what he cannot in any way know. Therefore, since I am now to love thee alone, give me to know thee entirely, so that I may also be able to love thee entirely. Eternal Wisdom The highest emanation of all beings, taken in their natural order, is through the noblest beings to the lowest, but their refluence to their origin is through the lowest to the highest. Therefore, if thou art wishful to behold me in my uncreated divinity, thou must learn how to know and love me here in my suffering humanity, for this is the speediest way to eternal salvation. The Servant Then let me remind thee today, Lord, of thy unfathomable love, when thou didst incline thyself from thy lofty throne, from the royal seat of the fatherly heart, in misery and disgrace for three and thirty years, and didst show the love which thou hast for me, and all mankind, principally in the most bitter passion of thy cruel death. Lord, be thou reminded of this, that thou mayest manifest thyself spiritually to my soul, in that most sweet and lovely form which thy immeasurable love did bring thee. Eternal Wisdom The more mangled, the more deathly I am for love, the more lovely am I to a well-regulated mind. My unfathomable love shows itself in the great bitterness of my passion, like the sun in its brightness, like the fair rose in its perfume, like the strong fire in its glowing heat. Therefore, hear with devotion how cruelly I suffered for thee. Chapter 2 What Happened Before the Crucifixion After the Last Supper, when on the Mount of Olives I gave myself up to that pangs of cruel death, and when I felt that he was present before me, I was bathed in a bloody sweat because of the anguish of my tender heart and the agony of my whole bodily nature. I was ignominiously betrayed, taken prisoner like an enemy rigorously bound and led miserably away. After this I was impiously maltreated with blows, with spittle, with blindfolding, accused before Caiaphas, and pronounced worthy of death. 
Unspeakable sorrows of heart were then seen in my dear mother, from the first sight she had of my distress, till I was hung upon the cross. I was shamefully presented before Pilate, falsely denounced, and sentenced to die. They stood over against me with horrible eyes like fierce giants, and I stood before them like a meek lamb. I, the eternal wisdom, was mocked as a fool in a white garment before Herod. My fair body was rent and torn without mercy by the rude stripes of whips. My lovely countenance was drenched in spittle and blood, and in this condition I was condemned, and miserably and shamefully led forth with my cross to death. They shouted after me very furiously, so that, Crucify, crucify the miscreant, resounded to the skies. The Servant Alas, Lord, the beginning is indeed so bitter, how will it end? If I were to see a wild beast so abused, I should hardly be able to bear it. With what reason, then, must not thy passion pierce my heart and soul? But, Lord, this is a great marvel to my heart. I would needs seek thy divinity, and thou showest me thy humanity. I would needs seek thy sweetness, and thou settest before me thy bitterness. I would needs conquer, thou teachest me to fight. Lord, what dost thou mean? Eternal Wisdom no one can attain divine exaltation or singular sweetness except by passing through the image of my human abasement and bitter bitterness. The higher one climbs without passing through my humanity, the deeper one falls. My humanity is the way one must go, my passion the gate through which one must penetrate, to arrive at that which thou seekest. Therefore lay aside thy faint-heartedness, and enter with me the lists of nightly resolve. For, indeed, softness beseems not the servant when his master stands ready in warlike boldness. I will put thee on my coat of mail, for my entire passion must thou suffer over again according to thy strength. Make up thy mind to a daring encounter, for thy heart, before thou shalt subdue my nature, must often die, and thou must sweat the bloody sweat of anguish because of many a painful suffering, under which I mean to prepare thee for, them, for myself. For with red blossoms will I manure thy spice gardens. Contrary to old custom, Thou must be made prisoner and bound. Thou wilt often be secretly calumniated and publicly defamed by my adversaries. Many a false judgment will people pass on thee. My torments must thou then diligently carry in thy heart with a motherly heartfelt love. Thou wilt obtain many a severe judge of thy godly life so also will thy godly ways be often mocked as folly by human ways. Thy undisciplined body will be scourged with a hard and severe life. Thou wilt be scoffingly crowned with persecution of thy holy life. After this, if only thou shalt issue forth from thine own will, and deny thyself, and shalt stand as a holy disengaged from all creatures in the things which might lead thee astray in thy eternal salvation, even as a dying man when he departs hence, and has nothing more to do with this world. If only thou shalt do this, then wilt thou be led forth with me on the miserable way of the cross. The Servant Woe is me, Lord, 
but this is a dreary pastime. My whole nature rebels against these words. Lord, how shall I ever endure it all? Gentle Lord, one thing I must say. Couldst thou not have found out some other way, in thy eternal wisdom, to save me and to show thy love for me, some way which would have exempted thee from the great sufferings, and me from their bitter participation? How very wonderful do thy judgments appear! Eternal Wisdom The bottomless abyss of my hidden mysteries in which I order everything according to my eternal providence, let no one explore, for no one can fathom it. And yet, in this abyss, what thou ask, ask it about, and many things besides are possible, yet which never happen. However, know this much, that, in the order of which emanated beings now are, a more acceptable or more pleasing way could not be. The Lord of nature knows well so that he can do in nature. He knows what is best suited to every creature, and he operates accordingly. How should man better know the hidden things of God than in his assumed humanity? How might he who has forfeited all joy through irregular lusts, be rendered susceptible of regular and eternal joy. How would it be possible to follow the unpractised way of a hard and despised life, unless it had been followed by God himself? If thou didst lie under the sentence of death, how could he, who should suffer the fatal penalty in thy stead, better prove his fidelity and love toward thee, or better excite thee to love him in return. Him, therefore, whom my unfathomable love, my unspeakable mercy, and my bright divinity, my most affable humanity, brotherly love, espousing friendship, cannot move to ardent love, what else shall st soften his stony heart? Ask the fair array of all created beings, if I could ever have maintained my justice, evinced my fathomless mercy, ennobled human nature, poured out my goodness, reconciled heaven and earth, in a way more efficacious than by my bitter death. The Servant Lord, truly, I begin to perceive that it is even so, and that he who want of understanding has not blinded, and who well considers the subject, must confess it to thee, and extol the beautiful ways of thy love above all ways. But still to follow thee is very painful to a slothful body. Eternal Wisdom be not terrified at the following of my passion. For he whose interior is so possessed by God that suffering is easy to him has no cause to complain. No one enjoys me more in my singular sweetness than he who stands with me in harsh bitterness. No one complains so much of the bitterness of the husks as he has as he to whom the interior sweetness of the kernel is unknown. For him who has a good second, the fight is half won. The Servant Lord, thy comforting words have given me much such heart that, methinks, I am able to do and suffer all things in thee. Therefore I desire that thou wouldst unlock for me the entire treasure of thy passion, and tell me still more about it. Chapter 3 How it was with him on the cross, according to the exterior man. Eternal Wisdom 
When I was suspended on a lofty tree of the cross because of my unfathomable love to thee and all mankind, my whole frame was grievously distorted. My bright eyes were extinguished and turned in my head. My divine ears were filled with scoffing and blasphemy. My delicate nostrils were wounded with foul smells. My sweet mouth was tormented with bitter drink, and my tender feeling with hard blows. The whole earth was not able to afford me any rest, for my feeble head was bowed down with pain and distress. My fair throat was unnaturally distended, my pure countenance polluted with spittle, my beautiful complexion faded. Lo, my comely figure withered entirely away as though I were an outcast leper, and had never been the fair and eternal wisdom. The Servant O thou most gracious mirror of all graces, in which the heavenly spirits regale and feed their eyes, and would that I had before me thy delicious countenance in its deathly aspect until I had well steeped it into the tears of my heart, would that I might behold again and again those beautiful eyes, those bright cheeks, that tender mouth, all ghastly and dead, till I had fully relieved my heart in fervent lamentation over my love. Alas, sweet Lord! Thy passion affects so deeply the hearts of some people that they are able to lament over thee with the greatest fervor, and weep through thee from thy very hearts. O oh God, could I, and, uh, and might I, now represent all devout hearts with the lamentation? Might I shed the tears of all eyes, and utter the doleful wor words of all tongues, then would I show thee to-day how near to my heart thy woeful passion lies. Eternal Wisdom No one can better show how deeply his heart is affected by my passion than he who endures it with me in the practice of good works. To me, a free heart, unconcerned about perishable love, and ever intent on following the main thing according to the type of my contemplated passion, is more agreeable than if thou didst always bewail me, and didst shed as many tears from weeping over my torments as there ever rain drops of water from the sky. For the following of me was the cause in which I suffered bitter death, although tears were also pleasing and agreeable to me. THE SERVANT O sweet Lord, since then an affectionate following of thy meek life and voluntary passion is so agreeable to thee, I will in future be more assiduous in a voluntary following than in a weeping sorrow. But, as I ought to have both, according to thy words, teach me how I shall resemble thee in both. Eternal Wisdom Renounce thy pleasure in dissolute sights and voluptuous words. Let that savor sweetly of love and be grateful to thee, which before was repugnant to thee. Thou shouldst seek all thy rest in me, shouldst willingly suffer wrong from others, desire contempt, mortify thy passions, and die to all thy lusts. Such is the first lesson in the school of wisdom, which is to be read in the open, distended book of my crucified body. And consider and see whether, if any one in all this world were to do his utmost, he could yet be to me what I am to him. Chapter 4 How Very Faithful His Passion Was The Servant 
Lord, if I forget thy worth, thy gifts, thy benefits, and all things, still one thing moves me and goes to my very heart. That is, when I well reflect not only on the way of our salvation, but also on its unfathomably faithful way. Dear Lord, many a one who bestows a gift on another, that his love and faith are better known by his way than by his gift. A small gift in a faithful way is often better than a great one without this way. Now, Lord, not only is thy gift so great, but also the way of it, methinks, is so unfathomably faithful. Thou didst not only suffer death for me, but thou didst also seek whatever is deepest in love, whatever is the most intimate and hidden, in which suffering can or may be experienced. Thou didst really do as though thou hadst said, Behold all hearts, if ever a heart was so full of love, look on all my limbs. The noblest limb I have is my heart, my very heart I have I permitted to be pierced through, to be slain and consumed, and bruised into small pieces, that nothing in me or upon me might remain unbestowed, that, so that ye might know my love. Alas, Lord, how was it in thy mind, or what were thy thoughts? Might one not indeed learn something farther on this head? Eternal Wisdom Never was there a thirsty mouth that longed so ardently for the cool fountain, nor a dying man for the pleasant days of life, as I longed to help all sinners and to render myself beloved to them. Sooner couldst thou recall the days that are gone, sooner couldst thou make green all withered flowers, and gather up in every drop of rain then possess the power to measure the love which I bear to thee and all mankind. And, therefore, was I so covered with marks of love that one could not have placed the small point of a needle on any spot of my lacerated body that had not its particular love marks. Consider that my right hand was nailed through, my right arm stretched out, my left grievously distended, my right foot perforated, my left cruelly transfixed, that I hung fainting, and in great distress of my divine limbs. All my delicate members were immovably fastened to the hard bed of the cross. My hot blood, because of my anguish, burst forth in many a wild gush, which overflowed my expiring body so that it was a most piteous sight to see. Behold a lamentable thing. My young, my fair, and blooming body began to fade, to wither and pine away. My weary and tender back had a hard pillow on the rough cross. My heavy body gave way. My whole frame was gashed with wounds and like one great sore. In all this my loving heart willingly endured. Chapter 5 How the soul attains hearty repentance and gentle pardon under the cross. The Servant Now then, cheer up thou soul of mine, Collect thyself entirely from all exterior things into the calm silence of thy interior, so that thou mayest break away, and wander at large, and run wild in the rugged wilderness of an unfathomable sorrow of heart, up to the high rock of misery, now contemplated, and mayest cry aloud from the depths of thy sad and languishing heart, till it resound over the hill and valley throughout the sky, and pierce even to heaven before all the heavenly host, 
and speak with thy lamentable voice thus. Alas, ye living rocks, ye savage beasts, ye sunny meads, who will give me the burning fire of my full heart, and the scalding water of my sorrowful tears, to wake you up, that ye may help me to bewail the unfathomable, heart-rending woe which my poor heart so secretly suffers. Me had my heavenly Father adorned above all living creatures, and elected to be his own tender and blessed spouse. And lo, I have fled from him. Woe is me! I have lost the beloved of my choice, my only one. Woe on that wretched heart, forever woe! What have I done? What have I lost? I have fled from myself, all the host of heaven, all that could give me joy and delight, have fled from me. I sit forsaken, for my false lovers were deceivers. O oh, misery and death! How falsely and miserably have ye not forsaken me! How bes despoiled me of all the good with which my only love had arrayed me! Alas, honor! Alas, joy! Alas, all consolation! How am I utterly robbed of you! Whither shall I turn myself? The entire world has forsaken me, because I have forsaken only my love. Wretched me! When I did so, what a lamentable hour it was! Behold in me a late daisy! Behold in me a slow thorn! All ye red roses, ye white lilies, take notice how very quickly that flower withers fades and dies, which this world gathers. For I must always thus living die, thus blooming fade, thus youthful grow old, thus healthy sicken. And yet, tender Lord, all that I suffer is of small account compared to my having made wrath thy fatherly countenance. For this is to me a hell and a grief above all grief. Alas, that thou shouldst have been so graciously kind, that thou shouldst have warned me so tenderly, and drawn me so affectionately, and that I should have so utterly despised it all. O heart of man, what canst thou not endure? As hard as steel must thou be not to burst utterly with woe. True, I was once called his beloved spouse. Woe is me! I am not now worthy to be called his poor handmaid. Never more, for bitter shame, may I raise my eyes. Henceforth in joy and sorrow my mouth to him must be dumb. Oh, how narrow for me is this wide world! O oh, God, were I but in a forest wild, Where no one might hear or see me, But where I could cry aloud to my heart's desire, To the relief of my poor heart, For other consolation I have none. O oh, sin, to what a pass hast thou brought me? Woe to thee, thou false world! Woe to him that serves thee! How hast thou rewarded me, seeing that I am a burthen to the myself, and thee, and ever must be? Hail, all hail to you, ye rich queens, ye rich souls, who, by the misfortunes of others, have become wise! who have continued in your first innocence of body and mind. How unwittingly blessed ye are! O pure conscience! O free and single heart! How ignorant are ye of the state of a heart oppressed and sorrowful through sin! Ah me, poor spouse! 
How happy was I with my beloved, and how little did I know it! Who will give me the breadth of the heavens for parchment, and depth of the sea for ink, leaves and grass for pens, that I may write fully out my desolation of soul, and the irreparable calamity which my woeful separation from my beloved has brought upon me? Alas, that ever I was born! What is left but for me to cast myself into the abyss of despair? Eternal Wisdom Thou must not despair. Did I not come into the world for the sake of thee and all sinners, that I might lead thee back to my Father in such beauty, brightness, and purity, as otherwise thou never couldst have acquired? The Servant O oh, what is that which sounds so sweetly in a dead and outcast soul? Eternal Wisdom Dost thou not know me? What? Art have fallen so low? Or hast thou lost thy senses? Because of thy great trouble, my dear child. And yet it is I, the all-merciful Wisdom, who, I who have opened the wide, the abyss of infinite mercy, which is, however, hidden from all the saints, to receive thee in all penitent hearts. It is I, the sweet eternal wisdom, who became wretched and poor, that I might guide thee back again to thy dignity. It is I who suffered bitter death, that I might bring thee again to life. Lo! Here I am, pale, bloody, affectionate, as when suspended between thee and the severe judgment of my father on the lofty gibbet of the cross. It is I, thy brother. Behold, it is I, thy bridegroom. Everything that thou ever didst against me will I wholly forget, as though it had never happened provided only that thou return to me, and never quit me more. Wash thyself in my precious, precious blood, lift up thy head, open thy eyes, and be of good cheer. Receive as a token of entire peace and complete expiation my wedding ring on thy hand, receive first thy robe, shoes on thy feet, and the fond name of my bride forever. Lo, I have garnered thee up with such bitter toil. Therefore, if the whole world were a consuming fire, and there lay in the midst of it a handful of flax, it would not, from its very nature, be so susceptible of the burning flame as the abyss of my mercy is ready to pardon a repentant sinner and blot out his sins. The Servant O my father, O my brother, O thou that can ravish my heart, and wilt thou still be gracious to my offending soul? O what goodness, what unfathomable compassion! For this will I fall prostrate at thy feet, O heavenly Father, and thank thee from the bottom of my heart, and beg of thee to look on thy only begotten Son, whom, out of love, thou gavest to bitter death, and to forget my grievous misdeeds. Remember, Heavenly Father, how thou didst swear of old to Noah, and didst say, I will stretch my bow in the sky, I will look upon it, and it shall be a sign of reconciliation between me and the earth. O oh, look now upon it, tender father, how cruelly stretched out it is, so that its bones and ribs can be outnumbered. Look how red, how green, how yellow love has made it. Look, O oh, heavenly father, through the hands, the arms, and the feet, so woefully distended, of thy tender and only begotten Son. Look at his beautiful body, 
all rose-color with wounds, and forget thy anger against me. Remember that thou art only called the Lord of mercy, the Father of mercy, because thou forgivest. Such is thy name. To whom didst thou give thy best beloved Son? To sinners. Lord, he is mine. Lord, he is ours. This very day will I enclose myself with his bare extended arms, in a loving embrace in the bottom of my heart and soul, and, living or dead, will never be more separated from him. Therefore do him honor today in me, and graciously forget that I, wherein, may have angered thee. For, methinks it were easier for me to suffer death than ever to anger thee, my heavenly Father, again. Neither afflictions nor oppressions, neither hell nor purgatory, are such causes of lamentation to my heart, as that I ever would have angered and dishonored thee, my Creator, my Lord, my God, my Saviour, the joy and delight of my heart. Oh, if for this I could give voice to the, to my grief of soul, through all the heavens, till my heart should burst into a thousand pieces, how gladly would I do it! And the more entirely thou forgivest my evil deeds, so much the greater is my sorrow of heart at having been so ungrateful in return for thy great goodness. And thou, my only consolation, thou, my tender elected one, eternal wisdom, how can I ever make thee a complete and proper return of thanks for having, at so dear a rate, healed and reconciled with thy pangs and wounds, the breach which all created beings could not have made good? And, therefore, my eternal joy, teach me how to bear thy wounds and love marks on my entire body, and how to have them at all times in my keeping, so that all this world and all the heavenly host may see that I am grateful for the f infinite good which, out of thy unfathomable goodness, alone thou hast bestowed on my soul. Eternal Wisdom Thou shouldst give thyself and all that is thine to me cheerfully, and never take them back. All that is not of absolute necessity to thee shouldst leave untouched. Then will thy hands be truly nailed to my cross. Thou shouldst cheerfully set about good works and persevere in them. Then will thy left foot be made fast. Thy inconstant mind and wandering thoughts shouldst thou make constant and collected in me, and thus thy right foot will be nailed to my cross. Thy mental and bodily powers must not seek rest in lukewarmness. In, my like, in the likeness of my arms they should be stretched out in my service. Thy sickly body must often, in honor of my dislocated bones, be wearied out in spiritual exercises and rendered incapable of fulfilling its own desires. Many an unknown suffering must strain thee to, to me on the narrow bed of the cross, by which thou wilt become lovely like me, and of the color of blood. The withering away of thy nature must make me blooming again. Thy spontaneous hardships must be to marry to my weary back as a bed. Thy resolute resistance to sin must relieve my spirit. Thy devout heart must soften my pains, and thy high flaming heart must enkindle my fervid heart. The servant. Now, then, fulfill thou my good wishes, according to thy highest praise, 
and according to thy very best will. For indeed thy yoke is soft, and thy burden light. Do this all, the, to all those who have experienced it, and who were once overladen with a heavy load of sin.